Hello and welcome to today's webcast, Qualys Technical Series Patch Management. Presenting today, we have Kevin O'Kiff, Security Architect here at Qualys. As a reminder, the Qualys Technical Series is a new live online training series taking place every second Thursday of each month. We'll discuss a new topic, starting with a general introduction walkthrough, followed by a live Q&A. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items. This webcast is being recorded and will be available for viewing after the event concludes. You can download the slide deck of this presentation by clicking on the attachment button in your BrightTalk interface. We will open for Q&A once Kevin has finished the presentation, but you can send your question at any point throughout the event by using the question button. And now, welcome Kevin. Thank you, Anne, and hello all. As Anne mentioned, this is the first in a series of trainings and how-tos for different topic areas. Today, we'll be covering Qualys Patch Management to share with you some of the best practices around Qualys Patch Management and sharing with you how other customers use uh, Qualys. As a security solutions architect at Qualys, I get to work with a lot of customers here in the UK, helping them plan, implement, and improve their Qualys solution. So I'll be drawing on that, as well as some past experience as a customer for today's session. So let's get started. So what are some of the current challenges we see here in the, as, a, as a solutions architect? So I think a lot of the normal ones that you see are, are shown in the screen here. But actually, the biggest one at the moment is the third one on that list. So remote systems. At the moment, many people are working from home. This is very different to how it was before. And one thing that we started to hear from our customers is, my VPN concentrator can't take the load. Or if you have DMZs where you publish your patches distribution service out to your DMZ service, your DMZ links can't handle the load. So it's how can Qualys help us? Another major problem that a lot of our customers face is the limited or no coverage of third-party applications. So while they have good and stable patching of their Windows patches, their application, their operating system patches, actually they're missing out on all their application patches. So missing out on Adobe, missing out on Google Chrome and Firefox and things like that. So how can Qualys help you? So the Qualys patch management system can automatically tell you from a patch, what, from a vulnerability, what patch is required. So being able to not only look at a vulnerability and then giving that list to the patching team, you can actually give to the patching team the patches they require to deploy. This saves you the effort of having to correlate this back manually or with some other tool and just give the, the patching team what they expect to be able to carry out the requirements of patching. We also have built into the platform over 35,000 different patches. Therefore, whether it's an operating system or it's a third-party application, you can deploy that patch directly from the platform straight away. There's no need to package any applications. There's no need to go looking for them and looking for the, how do I deploy this? It goes straight out to, from the platform to your machines. And most importantly, because this is using the Qualys Cloud Agent, this can work from anywhere. So whether you're all sat at home at the moment, or once we do get back into normal life and go back into the offices or into uh, hotels and things like that, as no matter where your client is, you will, will be able to patch it without putting any strain on your internal network. One of the most common questions I get asked is, we've already got a tool. How can you work alongside it? because we don't want to completely replace this tool straight away. So Qualys works as a standalone tool. We can do all the OS and the application patching for you, but it also works alongside other tools. So take SCCM, for example. If you have SCCM or WSUS, and that is already doing your operating system patches, and you need something to do your third-party applications or just fill in the gaps when your users are at home, then we can help you with that as well. And also another use case is for those machines that aren't connected to the corporate domains. They take DMZ or operational networks where you don't want to be creating uh, service accounts. You don't want to be putting those certificates or linking them into the corporate domain. So because the Qualys Patch Management Agent 
doesn't require anything like that. We can patch those as long as we have access to our portal. As I mentioned, this is all done by the Qualys Cloud Agent. So if you're already using the Cloud Agent for vulnerability or misconfigurations, identify those. You can then just tick a few boxes within the platform and you will then be able to do the patching for you as well. And this, once we are back in the offices and you have offices with hundreds or thousands of people and you're wondering, surely this is going to take down my internet links, we do provide the Qualys Gateway, which can be used as a cache for patches. So once the patches are being released, it will go out to the internet once and all subsequent agents will then grab the patches from the local cache. So let's get into a demo and let's have a look and see what uh, some of our customers are doing and how they're doing it from my demo environment. So the first thing you're going to want to do is enable your agents for patch management. So if you do already have agents deployed and you've got it enabled for certain modules but not patch management, you're going to want to go into the cloud agents and under the activation keys, you're going to want to edit it. You'll be able to see the different modules you have available to you and then click on patch management to enable that for this activation key. Once that is done, your agents will now start to download the patch management manifest and you'll want to just double check that in the configuration profile, that has also been enabled. This is enabled by default, but it's just worth double checking to make sure that no one's gone in and disabled it under patch management. Now, if we actually go into the patch management module, we'll start to see what is available here. So one thing you want to configure first is assign the licenses. So it might not be that you want to assign licenses to all your cloud agents. You might just want to assign it to a selection of your machines. So in this case, I'm going to assign it just to my Windows servers and Windows workstations. So selecting the correct tag that I've created for these. And then hitting save. Now, if we look at the actual patches and looking at our, at our patch catalog, what we can see here is by default, we filter out only what's missing in your environment and what is required. Also taking into account any supersedence, so you don't need to worry about that. In my demo environment, you can see I've got 901 patches missing. And then down the left-hand side, you can see how that breaks down by the app family, by the vendor, by the different categories, or type vendor severity or reboot required. And all of these you can select to narrow down the search. So selecting just Microsoft, it auto populates the field at the top and you will just see the required patches that are fall onto Microsoft vendor. If you wanted to have a look at all the patches available within the patch catalog, you can use the filter function to untick the patch status missing and this will now show the 10,000 non-superseded patches we have available. And you can untick for the non-superseded and see all the patches we have available, superseded or not. Looking at it from an assets point of view, we can go into the assets tab and being able to look at each individual assets. And from that, we then tell you how many patches are missing for that asset and how many have been installed. So for the different assets, some of them are pretty well patched. Some of them have a lot of outstanding patches. Now, how do we go about creating a job and how do we go about getting things built? So I want to create a job and I want to deploy a job. So I want to create it as a deployment job to deploy patches out to my machines. And in this scenario, I'm going to deploy it to Windows 7 and Windows 10. Then you come to the asset selection screen. You can either select individual assets one by one, or if you have tags, we can do use those tags. I have got some pre-built tags for Windows 7 and Windows 10, which we will use for this example. And then you get to select your patches. So going into the patch selector looks very similar to the patch catalog, but this time it's narrowed down just on the patches that are required from the tags I selected. 
the first thing you're probably going to want to do is down the left hand side the first option is do you want to see everything or just superseded so let's just look at the non superseded now, I've only got 290 patches required on my Windows 7 and Windows 10 estate. And we can narrow that down further. If you wanted to only patch your third-party applications and not your Windows, again, you could select uh, the Windows and then just change that slightly so it says not. And then now we'll only, now we'll only see the third-party applications that are not related to the Windows OS. Once you're happy with the selection, tick the box and add to the job. For patches that have the acquired from vendor, these are patches that require a subscription. Therefore, we aren't able to apply those patches ourselves, but you can, you can at least see that these are the ones required and you can take this off, offline to patch with a different mechanism. Then once the patches have been selected, they'll auto populate into this list and then we can move on to the schedule. So there's a few different ways to schedule um, within a platform. You can do an on-demand job, which will deploy the job once it's enabled straight away and it will do it as a one-off activity, or we can create it as a scheduled event. Choosing a start time, I'm going to say midday, so just as everyone's going for lunch, we'll do their patching on their machines. And then you're going to want to make it a recurring job. This will then mean that the patches will be deployed either daily, you can choose weekly and days of the week, or monthly, days of the month, or sorted by days of the week. In this case, I'm going to choose it weekly, and I'm going to do it every Tuesday at midday. The other option you have is to set the patch window. This can be quite useful for servers where you've got to finish the patching by a certain time. So if you're starting at midnight, you want to finish it by six in the morning before uh, working hours, you can set a patching window here. Just make sure that the patch stops at the right time. But as we're patching Windows 7 and Windows 10 clients, we're not too worried about that. So we'll leave that off. In the options profile, we can now start to look at deployment messages, user messaging, and how to work with the reboot. So the first thing you get to do is get to advise the user that you want to deploy patches. So all of these titles and messages are completely configurable to your own uh, messaging. And also for different countries, you can also use different languages um, so that uh, it's more local to them. Uh, and if we quickly patch is required. I've put a basic title and message in there, and then you get give the user time to defer it. So if they're in an important meeting or have an important meeting coming up, you get to allow them to defer it. You can configure both the time of deferment and also the number of times that they're allowed to defer it before we will go ahead and start the patching anyway. You are able to also advise the user as the patches are in progress, and then also advise them once it's complete. In terms of the reboot, you've got the suppress all reboot option, which is quite useful for servers where you want to manually reboot these in a controlled manner. So this will completely suppress all reboots from happening, and it will be up to the user to then go in and reboot it. Or if you wanted to, we could, again, do a reboot request and allow you to configure deferments and number of deferments. So again, type in your own message. And then configure how long you want to leave them. So let's remind them every 15 minutes. And they have four discernments for an hour. And then you want to configure also a reboot countdown, just to let them know that their machine will reboot. And they should probably save their work. And again, this can be configured. How long do you want to start the countdown from? So let's do it in the last 15 minutes. So 15 minutes before the reboot, we will start the countdown and let the users know to save their work. We can create the job in an enabled or disabled state. So if you want to create a job but not enable it straight away to come back to later, that is possible. And then we also give you the option to enable opportunistic patch download. And what that does is that allows, so up to three hours before the that are supposed to be deployed, we will start to download them. So in this case where we have set the patch to start at midday, 
it will start to download at nine in the morning. It will cache them all there. So that once the patch window opens at mid midday, you will then be able to start patching straight away. If not at midday, it will start to download the patches and it might not start the install until 12.30, 1 p.m., depending on how quickly it can download the patches. There's a final confirmation screen just before you click Save, and then it will create your job for you. And now we can see there's the job I created. There's 23 patches in that job, and there's 29 assets that have the tag Windows 7 or Windows 10 in this environment. Now let's say um, it's Patch Tuesday, as it was this week, and you want to add new patches. You want to deploy your June patches. Now, instead of having to go through and create a whole new job again, what you will end up doing is going into this job, editing it, and under the select patches, you'll be able to go back into that available patches and add any new patches you want to. So again, if I select not superseded, and uh, let's do security patches, Microsoft, and we're just going to add all the vendor, all the Microsoft security patches. One thing, if you do have a lot of patches to add, it might be worth going into the options and then changing it so that row shown is 200, and then you can add 200 at a time rather than just doing 50 at a time. Now that I've added those extra patches, I can click Save. And now when I go back into my job screen, I can now see that I have 200 patches and there's those still 29 tagged assets. So what will happen is next time around this, this asset comes to be patched, it will identify that there are new patches in the job and it will apply them if required. You, you probably want to start creating pilot groups and test groups and do things in a slightly more controlled manner rather than just patching everything. And this is where the tagging patch by tags comes in handy. So I've been at, and created a pilot patch machine group. So, and I've created a job. So this one is set to daily and these 10 machines, which are part of the pilot machines will actually get uh, their patches daily. And what you can do is add the patches into the pilot group first. Once you're happy that the pilot group has had them successfully, you're then able to then go back through, add them into your Windows 7 group, or if you've got multiple uh, Windows 7 and 10 groups, add them in. You can then break it down by different operating systems or different services. Depend however you can tag your machines or select your machines, we can patch based on those. And instead of having to create a new job every time, what you'll do is just add extra patches into the job that already exists. So all the part where you're doing the messaging, doing the settings, you don't have to do it again. All you're doing is just going, these are the new patches released this month. I'll just add them into the job. Once that uh, job is complete, you'll then start want to have a look and see how has it got on. So if we look at the pilot patching group, opening it up gives you all the information. And under assets, it will tell you what are the different machines and what current state they're in. So some of my machines are still patching and some of them have already completed. So looking at the ones that have already completed, I can see that for this machine here, two patches were installed, 526 were skipped. And we can click on the asset name to find out why were they skipped? So we can see that these were here were skipped for not a not applicable patch. The VLC media player was installed successfully. All the other ones were not applicable other than the .NET. Now to actually look at metrics and being able to dashboard this information out. We have the ability, like many of our other modules within the platform, we can create dashboards and widgets to show the information that is relevant to your business. So in this case, this dashboard is showing me how many missing security patches I have, how many patches I have overall, and which category. Are they security or non-security patches, or are they security tools? 
and also showing me the total number of patch, missing patches um, rather than just security patches. We can then break that down by missing patches by vendor, looking by missing patches by uh, just the Microsoft and if it, what severity it is, and also how many patches we have successfully installed um, with the Qualys patch management. Now, one, there's a few other things that you want to check while using patch, patch management. You want to make sure that these machines are got enough disk space. They have they, the, the users are rebooting as you expect, and this is where the, the dashboards within uh, vulnerability management can help. So, looking at disk space, so being able to break down how many machines have less than one gig of disk space, and these numbers can be configurable to show the uh, sizes that you, you, if you want to look at less than 100 meg or less than 500 meg, you can also configure it. But being able to see where you are likely to have problems with disk space before you deploy the patches allows your teams to actually go out, make sure that uh, the disks have enough space so we can have a successful patch, um, rather than afterwards finding out that the patches weren't applied successfully and then having to go in and remediate. Again, also after, re after patching, you're going to want to make sure that people are rebooting. So we have the reboot uh, dashboard, which shows us how many machines are pending a reboot from um, after patching, and also looking based on time variables, how many machines haven't rebooted in the last four weeks, how many machines haven't rebooted in the last 12 weeks. And this can also be quite useful when trying to buy management uh, buy-in for uh, forced reboots if you don't currently um, get the opportunity opportunity to force reboots on your machines, this could be a good way to show them that actually there is a problem here, people aren't rebooting, so this is uh, something we will need to start to implement. And we'll show you the trends as well, so you can see if people are better or worse, or if they start to reboot all at the weekend, this you'll start to see as the trend goes on. Another useful metric to start to look at is obviously the reason why you're patching your machines is you want to start to see that your vulnerabilities are coming down So making sure that you've, you've got good visibility on not only the number of vulnerabilities you have open, but also the number of vulnerabilities you have fixed. Hopefully, as one goes down, you should see the other one go up. And one of the interesting graphs to look at as well is your vulnerabilities by vendor. So if you think you're doing um, your Microsoft OS and the Microsoft applications patching well, you should have a small amount of vulnerabilities by Microsoft, and you might have a large amount from Adobe, Google, Oracle. But this is quite a useful um, chart to be able to see exactly where your problems lie, and then we will be able to then help you either by patching the Microsoft vulnerabilities or patching the Firefox vulnerabilities, whatever is required to fix in your environment. Now, if you do have a large environment with tens or hundreds of thousands of vulnerabilities, you're probably thinking, where can I start? Where, where shall I begin? And this is where the new prioritization in VMDR comes in. So with VMDR prioritization, we can give you the ability to select the tags you care about, select the, the threat in, indicators you care about, and then be able to actually prioritize based on those which patches need to be deployed. So again, if I use my Windows 7 and Windows 10 machines, Windows 7, Windows 10, as that loads, I can see I've got 34 assets in Windows 7 and Windows 10, of which there are 4,100 vulnerabilities, and this is how they break down on their CVSS rating for those vulnerabilities. Then looking at the detection age, in my case, most of my vulnerabilities were detected in the last 30 days. In most cases, this will be probably spread out, and you'll probably find that most of them are in the 180 days plus. You are able to select different uh, columns, so you can ignore the different vulnerabilities. So if you wanted to ignore vulnerabilities less than 30 days old, because this should be uh, remediated by your standard process it's currently going through, you can choose to do so. I'll leave it enabled. And then you, this is where you get to choose your threat indicators. So for different asset types and different asset tags, you can choose what matters the most for me or for your business. So as these are Windows 7 and Windows 10 machines, these are client machines where users are going to be uh, using it for emails and browsing, 
we're going to prioritize against um, vulnerabilities that have exploit kits or malware or active attacks or wormable. Because these are the ones most likely to have an impact for your Windows 7 and Windows 10 machine where users are clicking on those links or opening those emails um, that they shouldn't be. Again, we can also look at the attack surface, so disabling or removing from view the non-running kernels or non-running service because from a prioritization point of view, as those, as those services or kernels aren't running, those are stuff that you can leave for the second wave of patching or third wave of patching. Right now, you just want to remediate what is important, what is currently exploitable. If we prioritize that, and then based on the tags that I've selected and the threat indicators I've selected, there are 33 assets now, which are most of my assets. Um, not surprising, given that they are very vulnerable. But out of all my vulnerabilities, only 639 of those apply. And out of those 639, there's only 87 unique vulnerabilities that I need to patch across my assets. And then, as I mentioned, we also tell you exactly what 50 what patches are required, and in this case, I've got 54 patches required to remediate these. Down below, you can see exactly what the vulnerabilities are, um, or we can look at it from a patches point of view and look at what the patches are required and how many machines require them. And then we can also look at it from an assets point of view, so looking at the different assets and how many assets have to require different vulnerabilities. Straight from the, the VMDR window as well, we can go into a and create a job, or we can add it to an existing job. So as we've already got a Windows 7 and Windows 10 job, I can add this to an existing job. It will take me to the patch management module. And then I'll be able to select which job do I want to add it to. So in this case, I want to add it to my Windows 7 machines and Windows 10 machines. Hit and add, it will then add it. If you already have the patch in there, it will let you know, but all the other ones will be added. Now, if we look at the jobs, we should see that these now have been added in and we should have an increase in the number of patches that have been added in to the job. Okay, all of the ones I selected were already part of the uh, part of the original job. Like I mentioned as well, once the, once people are back in the office, you're going to want to be able to cache these uh, patches locally so that you're not having to get every agent going out to your WAN links and over to your uh, maximizing your internet. But this is where the Qualys Gateway service comes into play. So with the cloud agents, you can set them to use the Qualys Gateway service, which will then proxy these requests to the relevant content providers or to Qualys to then be able to then show you exactly the, to be able to then proxy it and get, save you on bandwidth. So if we look at my example, Qualys Gateway service, it's saved 34 gigs in terms of uh, in the last 30 days from the patches it's downloading. And I've currently got 32 agents in the last seven days, of which 26 have been active in the last 26 days. Uh, 26 have been active in the last 24 hours uh, through this. So once you start to scale this out to hundreds or thousands, you can see the savings that this could potentially have as you deploy patches. And as patches grow uh, to a much larger um, environment, So this is patch management. So quickly move back into the slides. So what do we achieve by using Qualys patch management? So one of the main things that we try and um, talk to customers about is the time to remediate. So from the moment we detect that vulnerability, how long does it take you to deploy the patch and remediate that vulnerability? With Qualys patch management, you can now detect the vulnerability with our agents within a few hours and then deploy it within the same, with the same agent straight away. So reducing the mean time to remediate across your assets, which will then reduce the number of vulnerabilities across your host, reducing your vulnerability host ratio as well.
I'd just like to take this opportunity while we're here to remind you all that uh, next Tuesday we do have a discussion on the issues of securing remote workforces um, with a demo um, of remote endpoint protection, which does include quality patch management along with other tools, which is free for 60 days for our current customers. And uh, the sign-up link and the times can be seen on the screen there. And now, Anne, I think we're ready for questions. Exactly. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, everyone, for listening. We will now open for questions. If you haven't yet, you can still submit your questions through your Brightalk interface. Let's start with the first question. Let me choose. Oh, how did this interact with on-premise or cloud clouds? Tools or cloud tools, sorry. Sorry, can you repeat that again? Oh, sorry, sorry. How does this interact with on-premise or cloud tools like AWS, SM, etc.? So we can work alongside uh, all these tools. We, we go for SECM, WSUS, and AWS, um, AWS uh, SM. We can work alongside these um, to patch these machines either on its own or as a extra. So if you're patching certain uh, patches with WSUS or SCCM, we can then go in on top and actually do the third-party applications or anything else that's been missed. Um, but we work nicely alongside of it, and there are quite a few of our customers do use us alongside um, their current tools um, while they're exploring and just with building confidence on it. Okay. Um, can I patch from the Windows 10 device? Also, can I script with PowerShell, REST API, and they are asking you to give some examples, if possible. So at the moment, it isn't possible to script with PowerShell or REST API, um, but we can patch Windows 10 devices, um, and all, that's all controlled straight from the uh, platform. Okay. Uh, also about Windows 10, can I patch a desktop during the Windows 10 restart? Uh, I can I, patch, I a patch a desktop during the Windows yeah. 10 restart? Yeah, yeah. I'm unsure what they mean by that question. Um, if, 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 if you've asked that question, if you could just rephrase it, um, and then we'll get back to it. Okay. Um, let me pick and choose another one. Uh, how do you check that the deployed patches are working correctly? So there's a couple of options here in terms of being able to check that the patches have deployed correctly. So within the job itself, you can go into the job and make sure that uh, it looks like it's deployed successfully from the job window. But then also, obviously, if that job was there to create, to patch vulnerabilities, you then should be able to go into the vulnerability dashboard or run vulnerability reports and be able to identify that the vulnerabilities that you were expecting to be patched by those patches have been remediated. Um, and in some cases, it might not be the case because you need to add registry keys or do additional configurations to patch it. So it's always good to go back and check that the vulnerabilities that you expected to have been remediated have been remediated more after mm -hmm. deploying the patches. Okay. One more. One is Linux OS patching uh, is going to be available. So Linux OS is something that's currently on our roadmap, and we're looking to release this later this year, looking at the current time frame of uh, Q4. Okay. So it's quite soon, right? <laughs> not, not uh, long. Yeah. Can the list of patches for a job be exported to take to a change board for approval? This is not something that's currently supported um, within the platform. Um, we are looking at ways to improve it um, and also looking at creating an API. Um, so in the next few months, we should be able to provide something that allows you to do just that. Okay. Can you patch directly uh, from a CVE? Yes, yeah, so you can search for a CVE. Um, so within the patch catalog, you are able to go into the the patch catalog. And well, actually, rather than just talk about it, let's screen share and let's actually show you it. So within the patches and under the patch catalog, 
um, we are able to search for a particular CVE. Uh, let me just find a CVE. So if we take a CVE in this case for Windows, and we'll take the latest Windows security update. One second, let me just find the CVE and then we can. Mm -hmm. I do I want to watch patch management? So within one of these. UIDs. Here's a CVE. So let's search for this CVE, which is in relation. So within the patch catalog, once you've got your CVE, you are able to, one of the search queries that you can do is CVE. And once you've pasted the CVE, well, well just need to spell it correctly, you're then able to search for the CVE, and if you might need to unfilter. So in my case, I had the filters, so my machines don't need it. But in this case, I've searched for the CVE, and I can tell you that for these, this CVE, there are four possible patches, two for Opera and two for Google Chrome, and none of my machines actually need that. We've got more questions, Anne. Yeah, we do. I'm, I'm, we have so many questions that, you know, uh, not so easy. Uh, someone is asking you a question about the demo, and uh, he's saying, telling us that he didn't quite see how, the, uh, how to automate this patching, and you showed us some filtering to create job. But how do you save that filter? Filtering to create a job. So... If you're creating a filter, so let's create a filter here. So I want to look for uh, not Microsoft, um, and uh, let's look at and and category security patches. Let's stop that. Let's just quickly use the sidebar filter search terms because they're much easier. Okay, let's look for just security patches. And once you have your query that you're happy with, you are able to save this search query, um, give it a title. So um, application security patches in this case. And then you can then use this, so if I clear out the search term, you are then able to go back through and add this search term quite quickly from the save search menu rather than having to type it in every time, especially once you start mm -hmm. to create a query that is quite long. You might want to uh, do it, so not vendor Microsoft and category security patches. Click on that, and that adds it straight back in. Okay. Okay, um, next one. Uh, how do you connect the eyes from premi premises to cloud? Premise, I'm oh, sorry, premises to cloud. How, how do you connect the eyes from premises to cloud? So if you are if you're got all your agents on premise and you want to connect it to, um, to the cloud, you have two options. You can either let the agents talk directly to the cloud um, where it will then pull down the patches uh, individually, or you can push it through one of our QGS appliances, and you can have multiple of those spread out across your networks to be able to then cache those patches locally. So in a large environment, I would recommend that you have your caches spread out in different offices and maybe more than one per office, so that when your agents do require the patches, and some of these Microsoft patches are now over one gig in size, you can cache them locally so that um, instead of having to go to the cloud every time, you are just coming to the local uh, cache, which is a lot quicker to distribute and saves on WAN bandwidth. Okay. 
Uh, one more. Is scanning and patching management come in a single tool? So it comes it's a single platform. It's the same platform. Um, for, so within Qualys, you can do your vulnerability scanning. You can do your patch management, as well as your identification of misconfigurations and other things, all from the same cloud agent. So the one agent can actually do multiple things, and it's all done from within the same platform, the same UI. Um, and that UI can then be split out, and it has role-based access control, so that if you want to just give um, cloud uh, the patching to the patching teams, the vulnerabilities to the vulnerability teams, you can split it out so that the teams only have access to what they require. But in terms of being able to actually see the vulnerabilities and then patch those, as you can see from the different modules we have available within uh, the Qualys, it's all under one platform, under one tool, using one agent on your machine. Hmm. I'm waiting for the activation key. <laughs> there you go. So <laughs> as you can see, we have the vulnerability management and the patch management, and it just depends what you have licensed. And then once it's licensed, you can then take and apply it to your machines. We have another question related to the license. What is the difference between patch management and the NDR in terms of features and licensing? So within the NDR, you do get patch detection. So what that gives you is the ability to identify what the patches are, what patches are missing from your environment, but it doesn't give you the ability to create jobs. So within Qualys Patch Management, you'll be able to see, I've got this patch missing or I've got this patch missing but you won't actually be able to deploy the patch because that requires the extra patch management license. Okay. Are we waiting for the dashboard to appear? Or? Uh, no, we can move on to the next question. Okay. No problem. I was waiting, you know, I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, is there any information around the job reporting on the widget? Uh, our customer is saying that he can see that you can cho choose patches, assets, and jobs, but he can't find how you find the jobs reporting. So for reporting on a specific job, instead of using the dashboards, you need to go into the jobs section, and within the jobs section, um, you can view the uh, progress, and then from that progress screen, you can see whether the machine's pending, like it is in this case, or if we go for a job that's already been ran. And um, so looking at this one, looking at the view progress actually shows you how each machine is progressing along with those patches. So well, I can see that some of these have completed, five patches were installed and 253 were skipped. Uh, and for some of them, they're still patching. So I've got 201 that have been patched, uh, 56 have failed and one that's been skipped. So, you won't be able to actually see it from the dashboard. You'll have to go into the job progress uh, screen to see how each individual machine is progressing. Hmm. Another question about Patch, patch Tuesday. How can one extract Patch Tuesday uh, easily? Sorry. Two IDs, sorry. Yeah, Patch Tuesday, two IDs easily. So it's extra. For the QIDs for Patch Tuesday, uh, I would recommend, um, so within our dashboard community, um, one of our SMEs actually produces a dashboard for Patch Tuesday, highly recommend it. It's updated every every month. Um, it's just recently been updated for this month, Patch Tuesday. And from that, you can pull out, um, there's already a predefined dashboard that you can import into your environment, but also from within that, you can also pull out the QIDs for this month's Patch Tuesday. Okay. Uh, when you create a job, does it cause traffic when the task goes live and it requires the agent on, on the agents on each site, or does it gather the information from the database? So when you create a job, um, the it will create a bit of network traffic as the machine uh, downloads that manifest for that job for the first time. And then depending on what that job, um, how that job is configured, so if that job is configured to do a patch job and run it straight away, then it will now generate network traffic as it pulls down those patches from that job manifest. But if you create a job manifest today and you only set, set it to run on, on uh, next Tuesday, then it won't actually do much until next Tuesday, at which point it will then 
look at which patches it needs and then download those at that time. Okay. Um, what operate, operating systems and third-party applications are support, supported uh, and are on the roadmap? So at the moment, we support um, the Windows operating system and quite a lot of different applications. So just if I quickly unfilter the missing, you'll be able to see just some of the app families and that we have in our database. But the best way to identify what you're missing is to either trial it, and then we will populate automatically what patches we can see that are missing um, based on your assets, or if you Re reach out to your TAMS, we have a document that shows out exactly which um, patches, which vendors we support, and if the vendor um, has any special considerations, a bit like Java for subscription module. Okay. Can you use this to patch AWS EC2 instances? Yes, definitely. So if the machine supports having the cloud agent installed, and if it's one of our supported operating systems and applications, then no matter if the agent is installed on a, a laptop, desktop, EC2 instance, or an Azure virtual machine, we can patch it um, no problem. Okay. Um, uh, we still have some, some, some time for a few questions. Um, uh, how how well does this work with uh, SCCM? Is it difficult to get them to work together? And what are the usual problems encountered? Um, so I do have a couple of customers that have got it installed alongside SCCM. So they currently use SCCM to patch their Windows and uh, their Office applications, and then Qualys does the Adobe, the browsers, um, and anything else that the SECM is missing. And it works successfully. I haven't seen or heard of any issues from them. Um, and it, it, they work, that there isn't any uh, clashing between them. OK. Um, there are a lot of questions about the Windows updates. Uh, I know you already answered part of it, but um, how does this handle Windows features updates? And what about rollback? So we can't do feature updates through this. So this is only deploying patches, not uh, feature updates. Uh, so feature updates will still have to be done via a different method. And in terms of the rollback, we do support uh, rollbacks that do support rollback. So um, if you so if we search for is rollback true within the, the patch catalog, you'll get the list of as, uh, patches that can actually be rolled back. And these are going to be mainly Microsoft patches um, because they have the ability to be rolled back. Things like uh, Adobe and Google Chrome, they, they don't have the ability to be rolled back because actually when you release, install the patch, it's just installing a new version and uninstalling the old version. So we can't roll those back. Okay, one last question, and then we'll have to say goodbye. Uh, how does the getaway service work? Does that... Uh, set up in a machine to act as a cache so you can have more than one spread amount in the internal network? This is so, the first part of the question, so I'll stop there and then I'll ask the second part of the question. <laughs> so the, the gateway service is uh, a proxy service, um, but it's, uh, it's doing, so for the caching part, it needs to also be an SSL uh, in inspecting proxy. So the way it works is in the same way that you might already have your quality agent talking to the cloud through a proxy. Instead of talking through your current proxy, you will set it to work through the Qualys Gateway Service. The Qualys Gateway Service will look at the request coming through. If it's something that it's got cached, it will answer back from its local cache. If it's not, it will just forward on to the, the relevant uh, provider to go and download the patch. Or if it's an update for the Qualys platform, like a, a vulnerability update, it will just uh, talk directly to the Qualys platform um, to tell us that there is the, this is the new deltas for the vulnerabilities for this machine. Okay. Um, does the getaway machine need to be a server, or can it be a workstation? 
Um, so the gateway service is a virtual machine. So if we look at how it operates, so you download a virtual machine uh, image and import that either into your VMware platform or your Hyper-V platform or any virtual platform that will support it. Um, and that is where you would install it. So you could, if you wanted to, install it on a desktop. You would just need to install Hyper-V or VMware um, to run it, as, and as long as it meets the minimum specifications as well. Um, and I also remember that you said that uh, they, they were asking about uh, you can have more than one appliance, so you mm. can have multiple mm. appliances uh, spread out across your network, and you can tell the agents to talk to multiple appliances as a failover. So if you have two appliances in one office, you can set them. Of, uh, you can tell the agents that these are the two appliances. And if one of them is fails, it will automatically go and talk to the other appliance. Okay. Uh, how does the, the this is really uh, Kevin the last question? I promise. Uh, no, how fine. does <laughs> how does the backend server scanning process work? How many servers can I patch at the same time? Uh, can I cope with uh, two thousand servers in one patch group? Give us more explanation on this, Kevin, please. <laughs> so the, you can have as many as you want within a single patch group. But there isn't a limitation of how many machines you can have into a single patch group. So we have customers out there who have 150,000 machines, and they're currently using uh, Qualys Patch Management to patch their machines. So you, it is, uh, you know, very – it's built on our Qualys uh, platform so it's elastic and it's built to expand if required um, and then what was the second part sorry of that question Anne? Uh, how uh, well uh, sorry uh, I put the question as uh, as answered to be sure that I wouldn't ask you the question twice oh, no I, re I remember it um, so in terms of how the, how does it ha that they kick off so if you set them all for a certain time they will all kick off at that time or within uh, a minute or two of that time. If you set an on-demand job, which is basically go as soon as you get this job manifest, then it will depend on how quickly the machines get their job manifest. But if you schedule it to happen at Tuesday at midday, then they will all start to patch at Tuesday at midday. Okay. Um, what that can be defined in patch management? Kindly let us know the queries or sources to get queries. And in terms of the widgets that can be defined in patch management, the best thing would be to reach out to your TAM um, to work with them to understand uh, what you're trying to achieve. And then either the TAM or with one of our solutions architect like myself, we can work with you uh, to create the dashboards and widgets that uh, suit your business need. Okay. Uh, this is about ergonomy, ergonomy. I don't know how you say it in English. Uh, if there, if there are 300 patches in the patch list, is there a function to put everything at the same time and add it into a job? You know, not to select them one by one. Yeah. So with, when uh, selecting patches, you can select um, up to 200 at a time. So in this case, where I've got the uh, 6,330 patches. I can do, if I change the row shown, I can change this to 200 and add 200 at a time. So you won't be able to add 300 at a time, but we can add 200 at a time into a job. Um, and then once you've added those 200, you can then move on to your next 200. Easy. Okay. Can multiple QDS be deployed and grouped together as a downstream? So they can't be grouped together. So you can deploy them in the same location, and you can tell the agent that you have multiple QGSs by giving in the proxy of the agent, you tell it that there are multiple IP addresses that it can talk to, uh, but you don't group them together from within uh, the platform. They, they all operate independently. Um. One last one. <laughs> uh, let's go for are Max on your roadmap? Uh, so Max are on the roadmap. Then again, this is due to be coming to us uh, later this year. So just um, 
as we, after so first we're going to be releasing support for Linux patching. Once we have that one, we will then be focusing on Mac patching as well. Okay, so I guess that we we had all the questions from our audience, and we are. Uh, it's, it looks like, you know, we, we answered everything, Kevin. So we had the time to answer to all the questions. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Kevin, for taking the time to answer all those questions. Um, you, we are going to say goodbye, but first we are going to say you that you will be able to listen to us again next month on June 16. We haven't decided the topic yet, but Kevin and I and all the team are working on a nice topic for you guys. And we will meet next week on June 16. Thanks to you guys. Thanks, Kevin. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you.